Hi guys, I'm George Dahl and welcome back. Today's log into the old film journal is a 1980s space horror fantasy film starring a naked Kirk Douglas in which he and Farrah Fawcett live out a romantic existence on the remote and titular planet of Saturn III. Though their blissful solitude is soon disturbed by the arrival of a murderous space pilot played by Harvey Keitel and his robot, Hector, who malfunctions and attempts to kill everyone. So, Saturn III premiered in the midst of a science fiction renaissance in the late 70s, and it was the passion project of Star Wars production designer John Barry, and it was conceived as a Frankenstein's monster story in space. A suspense thriller of galactic proportions with spectacular set design, and Barry was set to direct. However, meddling executives, a troublesome star, and an unworkable gigantic robot puppet all conspired to chip away at Barry's vision until he was unceremoniously booted from the project after only three weeks and replaced as director by the film's producer, Stanley Donnan. So, this movie, to be honest, is a lot less than the sum of its parts, but there's plenty to enjoy here, and the behind-the-scenes maelstrom is just juicy enough to warrant the retrospective treatment. So before we get started, let's put this whole thing in context real quick. Obviously, after Star Wars, the culture experienced a major science fiction deluge. You can see this phenomenon play out in real time in the pages of Starlog magazine, a fan quarterly which debuted in 1975. And I think actually this is a good way to illustrate what I'm talking about. It's a periodical I've been really fond of collecting over the years. If you were to look through the first few issues of Starlog, they are a rather low-key affair, interested mostly in looking back and reminiscing about Star Trek a show which had been canceled 10 years prior, and the magazine filled its pages with episode guides and photos and whatever other Star Trek or minor sci-fi TV info it could scrounge up. But after Star Wars debuted on the scene, look out. This return to the outer space-bound action-adventure strain of sci-fi storytelling, combined with horror elements and new developments in blue screen matting and special effects technology, with a little late 70s futurism thrown in for good measure, produced some awesome science fiction movies from the period of about 1978 to 82. Films like Alien, Outland, Galaxina, Battle Beyond the Stars, Star Trek, The Motion Picture, The Black Hole, and television shows like Battlestar Galactica and Buck Rogers in the 25th century. So going into the movie Saturn 3, I was obviously forewarned of the movie's terrible reputation. Uh, but I was intrigued by the cast. I'd seen still photos from the movie, and since I'm sort of a completist of this sort of genre and area of time we're talking about, I figured it had to have, you know, some redeeming value. Sure, the opening Star Wars ripoff shot was a little dismaying, but when we're thrust onto the command ship of what appears to be a galactic empire of some sort, I was kind of blown away by the striking set design and frenzy of layered sounds and visuals, some rather psychedelic and abstract, some incredibly impressive and imposing, it seemed to me like this was a movie with a great driving momentum, playing around in an impressively conceived universe amidst a solid musical score by Elmer Bernstein, which built some suspense and excitement. I mean, look how cool this shot is of the pilots marching in the midst of the giant flag of a fascistic space country or government or whatever. Who cares? It looks like badass, and I was eager to find out where this thing was going. Then Harvey Keitel kills some guy by blowing him out of the airlock, the guy freezes in the vacuum of space, and his rigid body is smashed to pieces. Uh, I mean, to me, this movie kept getting better and better. Okay, I mean, this weird shot of a plastic spaceship going through Saturn's rings looks like a kid is dragging it through a bathtub. It wasn't exactly blowing my mind, but once Keitel's character arrives on Saturn 3, we're treated to another sequence involving an incredible set, a sterilization chamber that quarantines any space germs and prepares the visitor for entry into the laboratory. How cool is this? This is a great entrance for our lead characters, as they all reveal their faces behind their helmets. We quickly learn the score. Fawcett and Douglas are the benevolent scientific keepers of the small moon, and to them, Keitel's character is just another functionary of the Galactic Empire that employs them. And you get the sense that they're really ambivalent to whatever its larger goals are that they periodically have to suffer through corporate inspections and nosiness from top brass, which they tolerate, but they prefer really to focus on their work. The movie itself is also not concerned with whatever the space empire is up to. It's all kept deliberately vague, and for the most part, that's okay for the kind of story they're telling. Occasionally, there is dialogue placed throughout the film that deals with the uncertain fate of Earth, with Douglas bemoaning its environmental decline. When I was last there, if you went outside and breathed, the pollution count was liable to rust your tubes. <laughs> it appears from these brief bits of dialogue 
that human society has degenerated into an ambitious technocratic empire obsessed with conquest and industrial progress. Douglas and Fawcett are stationed on what could be the most Earth-like environment that we see throughout the entire film, as it's a seemingly harmonious union between rock, plant, and technology. If not an environmental paradise, the boundaries are at least clearly drawn between elements. The moon Saturn III is a pleasant union of Terra and Tech, standing in stark contrast to the gleaming and sterile world of Harvey Keitel's character of Captain Benson. Their opposing worldviews are even apparent in their costume design. The two scientists of Saturn III wear bulky space suits, obviously white to reflect their goodness, and the only real utility of these suits is to preserve the life of its wearer outside the lush greenhouse environment. And once the suit's usefulness has been served, the scientists quickly discard them in favor of comfortable earth-toned leisure wear, whereas Keitel's suit is less bulky, more sleek, tight-fitting. It's a sinewy, muscular apparatus that mimics the human body, and is perhaps a sort of replacement for it, which Benson does not readily remove when indoors. It was a costume that required constant updating on set and care as pieces often became detached with the actor's movement, whereas Douglas's tan costume and weird flared pants were purportedly so comfortable, the actor kept them and was known to wear them around his Los Angeles beach home for many years. I didn't know that. After the initial introduction to the space station and an earnest kickoff to the proceedings, the movie begins to fall apart rapidly. The biggest reason for me is that it seems that Harvey Keitel's character of Benson, his presence is really murky. It seems as if he's simply taken the place of the man he killed earlier, and that the dead man's mission was simply to bring the robot to Saturn III, to aid in the farming activities of the scientists. And Keitel proceeds to basically just do that. He simply sets up the robot in his spare time, and makes weird sexual advancements toward Farrah Fawcett. Did no one back on the ship notice that the other pilot had been murdered? I mean, I could totally understand if Benson took his chance to pose as a robot delivery worker in order to hatch an escape, or to rebel against the Empire, or take over Saturn III, but he doesn't do any of those things. He just kind of hangs out, assuming another man's identity. So what's his endgame? I mean, maybe the guy just needed a change of scenery, but it seems like he's making all of this up as he goes along. And considering Hector the robot becomes something of a surrogate for Keitel's villainy, an extension of his evil will, almost literally, it would serve the movie better if we had a more concrete idea of what Keitel was actually after. The other unsettling element of Keitel's character is that we're treated to a fairly deadpan performance from an actor who usually graces the screen with a lot of energy, attitude, and swagger. But in this movie, he's got all the range of a Jedi in the Star Wars prequels, and even the hairdo to match. I was immediately put off when his first lines of dialogue came out of his mouth. You're quite an event in our lives. Well, I guess you don't get many drop-ins on Saturn 3. And the reason for this jarring disparity? Well, he's been dubbed entirely by another actor in post-production. Is that the truth? Yes. So apparently during production, Harvey Keitel and Stanley Donen didn't get along very well, which culminated in uh, Harvey Keitel refusing to return for post-production ADR. So Donen just replaced him with British actor Roy Dodderus, who some people might recognize as the audiobook narrator for all of the Game of Thrones books. I've heard some people say that they like the voiceover because it makes Benson seem stranger, more robotic, and detached. No touch and contact. You mean don't touch? Correct. But as someone who's familiar with Harvey Keitel's work, and it's really kind of hard not to be, I find it to be very distracting and it takes me out of the movie. Can he play? Yes. I play, he plays. Don't you like me? I don't know. It's a real shame that you can't hear the lines as Harvey Keitel perform them. I would think you'd want to hear that just for historical value, but unfortunately, none of those lines exist. That dialogue track is gone. I said to blank that, no blank it. But in addition to Harvey Keitel's synthesized post-production performance, there are a lot of elements of Saturn III and plot points in particular, subplots that are brought up and then never adequately elaborated upon, and not least among them, is the Blue Dreamers subplot. After their uneasy meeting, Fawcett directs Keitel to his guest quarters where he says he'll sleep fine once he takes a few blues. Blues, Blue Dreamers. Sleeping pills? You've never heard of blues? You really need a shut life out here, don't you? Fawcett and Douglas discuss the drug, and Kirk seems to remember taking these with some fondness. Did you ever take one? Blue Dreamers? Did you? Years ago. Which indicates his past life might have been a little more sordid and fast-paced. 
and he may have not been so different from Benson at one point in his life. We even get a meaningful close-up of these things, which seems to imply that they will become important later, but then they aren't at all. So there actually is a deleted scene that further elaborates upon the blues and their effects. And when our characters take them, they sort of get drunk or high or whatever. They kind of just prance around. <laughs> what should I wear? Anything or nothing. They're not choosy anymore. But that doesn't really go anywhere either. It's like, so what? Hey, you've never seen it before. My coming out dress. But while we're here, let's elaborate further on this uh, notorious deleted scene in which Farrah emerges from the bedroom dressed like the fetish version of a uh, Power Ranger villain. Yikes. Fawcett found this costume so mortifying that she demanded the scene be removed. Though that didn't stop the producers from plastering it all over the promotional materials for the foreign release. For years, this scene was thought to be lost forever. But, you know, fortunately for us, the scene has recently been found, is available online, in its full glory. Uh, yeah, you know, I'll post a link in the description, but I'm telling you, you know, watch at your own risk. Because, I mean, if you found the 30-year age gap difference romance between uh, Farrah and Kirk to be a little bit off-putting, uh, I can tell you the cringe meter is sent into the stratosphere here. So, you've been warned. I'm sure I'll hate it! Then we'll hate it together! <laughs> So, Farrah Fawcett was quite the hot commodity in the late 1970s. She had appeared in films like Logan's Run, and she had a high-profile marriage to $6 million man star Lee Majors. And then she rocketed to superstardom with a lead role in the hit show Charlie's Angels in 1976. And of course, everybody has seen this image. Your old man probably had this poster on his bedroom wall back in the day because it sold over 12 million copies. Charlie's Angels was a smash hit, and even though Farrah was the obvious breakout star, she was only making half the money per episode as her co-star Kate Jackson. She tried to renegotiate her contract for his 10% cut of merchandising rights and a raise in salary, but when she failed to reach a satisfactory agreement, she dropped out of the show. Farrah said of the show in an interview following her exit, When the show got to be number three, I figured it was our acting. But when it got to be number one, I decided it could only be because none of us wears a bra. At the urging of Lee Majors, a cyborg who once fought Bigfoot, and a guy who was not only her husband, but the other half of their joint production company, she went all in on pursuing a theatrical career, only to be slapped with a lawsuit for breach of contract by ABC and Columbia Pictures. The perception of her having burned bridges made every Hollywood film choice she made extremely critical, and to make matters worse, going into 1979, hers and Lee Majors' marriage fell apart leaving her in the middle of a messy divorce proceeding. And worse yet, her big post-Angels theatrical debut in the Charles Grodin comedy, Sunburn, flopped. She's very pretty. It's a movie about a pretty girl. That's one reason to have movies, especially in the summertime. To me, that's good enough rationale for Sunburn. And all I'm saying is if it had made sense, if it had been a better script, it would have been nicer to look at. I enjoyed Farrah's style and her looks. Jean thought the movie was a loser, so one yes and one no. Farrah was handed the script on a cross-country flight by a producer named Lord Lou Grade, who happened just to be traveling with her. He was thinking about optioning the script from Donnan, and when he saw Farrah, he just reflexively handed it to her, and supposedly, after she'd finished the script during the flight, she said she liked it and agreed to do it. So Grady just got on the phone with uh, Donnan and said, hey, I'm going to buy it. By the way, we got Farrah. And that's a real testament to her star power at the time. She basically got the movie made. But according to many sources, and even to Farrah herself, her time on the production of Saturn III was, you know, less than ideal. Anyway, then, then you did a couple of movies that were not the greatest successes in the world. Did you, did you really have a, a point there where you said, oh, wow, you did Saturn III, I remember. Was that it? <laughs> that's a good one. And, well, you know, and it didn't and really... No, for you for no, a while. no. An interesting story. The title of that before I, be, uh, before we finished, right. uh, before I started, was the Helper. The Helper. And it was very interesting. It was about um, a, a, a man manufactured robot who fell in love because he felt the emotions of right. the man who had made him. And it was very interesting. The script before right. we started. And then all of a sudden, I don't know what happened. So the original script by John Barry was really supposed to lean harder into the themes of human malice infecting the technology that it touches. And I have to admit that watching this movie in 2021, even though it was muddled and a botched version of Barry's original ideas, 
It does come off as a fairly prescient meditation on the idea of AI replacing human labor, something I think that we're all sort of uneasy about. What's wrong with you today? Today? I'm not today. I'm yesterday. A lot of good ideas there, like, you know, how, how perfect can a perfect machine be if it's built by a fallible human? And Donnan really believed in the script, and he championed Barry for the director's role. But still, he decided that the script needed a little more tweaking, and so he hired British author Martin Amos. Martin Amos' work generally focuses on interpersonal dramas and social commentaries, so he seems like an odd fit. But apparently he was a science fiction fan, and he was excited to take on the project. Though no real record of screenplay authorship seems to exist that could isolate the contributions of Barry, Amos, or Donan in reshoots, the most complete relic of the film's screenplay production exists in Amos's 1984 novel Money, which I'd actually read about seven years ago at the behest of Amos's friend and public intellectual Christopher Hitchens, who recommended the book highly in an interview. So I have to admit, dear viewer, I don't remember too much about my experience of reading Money other than finding it a little bit sordid, and, uh, but it was funny, witty, clever. But I wish I'd had the benefit of knowing what the book is a thinly veiled allegory for, which is obviously uh, Amos' work on Saturn 3. And that the character of the aging actor of Lorne Guyland in the book, a character who's fond of disrobing in front of producers and uh, directors to show that he's still young and virile, was actually obviously based on Kirk Douglas. Doesn't it disgust you to be used by him, to be touched by an old man? Can't you feel the decay? <laughs> And in a uh, 2013 interview, Amos actually commented a little bit on his experience working on Saturn 3. When actors get old, they get obsessive about wanting to be nude. And Kirk wanted to be naked. Many have surmised that Kirk Douglas obviously uh, was enticed into the role for two reasons. He was actually pretty hip in the projects he chose, and he saw that science fiction was the latest trend train to hop on. And also, it probably couldn't have hurt too bad that he would be sharing steamy sequences with a hot, you know, young actress. I don't think that bothered him too much. Kirk had already shown a penchant for wanting to star alongside young female leads, like in Brian De Palma's The Fury, alongside Amy Irving, or in the uh, Omen ripoff Holocaust uh, 2000. Here he is alongside actress Agastonia Belli on the film's poster, shirtless no less. Egomania and difficulty aside, Kirk's star power does carry the picture, and you cannot deny his gravitas and screen presence, even if he's a little rubbery in his facial expressions and body movements, and a bit hammy at times. I think you have me. It might seem odd that the producers opted for such a large age gap between their two romantic leads, but apparently this had been an idea that had clung to the project from early development stages, as the producers had initially wanted the 50-something Sean Connery for the role. But he had to turn it down because apparently Her Majesty's favorite spy hadn't paid British taxes for 10 years and could not return to the country for filming. It seems that the idea might have been that Kirk Douglas and Farrah Fawcett's unconventional relationship was meant to be seen as an inherently human bond opposed to the cold calculation of Benson, who finds their attraction illogical. There's even a passing line where Keitel mentions sex as being more of like a passing physical utility in the more cosmopolitan areas of the Empire. You have a great body. May I use it? I'm with the Major. For his personal consumption only? Yes. That's penally unsocial on Earth, you know that? Well, it's not here. Which makes Farah and Kirk's pairing more a product of genuine feeling and intellectual stimulation than one of pure bodily attraction. That being said, there is an awful lot of pawing done by the elder Douglas, who allegedly balked at Ferris' refusal to do full frontal nudity, exclaiming, She's only a fucking TV actress. Douglas's headstrong attitude may have also been the reason for Barry's early departure. Many have insinuated that Douglas badmouthed Barry's directing ability to the studio bosses, and that he felt diminished as an actor when Barry continually spent more time fiddling with the giant $2 million robot than he was guiding his leads through their scenes. In fact, Saturn 3 historian Greg Moss makes the case that Douglas intentionally made work difficult for John Barry in an attempt to usurp the director and take on the filmmaking duties himself. As some have reported, Kirk did indeed direct the film for three days before it was decided that Donan would step in and pick up the pieces. I'm your commanding officer. Uh, open the door. The robot, Hector, by all accounts, was an unmitigated disaster. 
a poorly designed and conceived behemoth that was supposedly inspired by Leonardo da Vinci's drawings of the male physiognomy, but which looks more like a goofy, center-heavy slab of beef with weak appendages and a poorly protected and flimsy head optical eye uh, er, uh, tentacle. Try as they might, the filmmakers could not make this thing look at all scary. I can't imagine this gargantuan clumsy thing helping anyone do anything in a technological farming capacity. Hector, hand the flask to the Major. Abort. Glad you didn't ask him to shake hands. So just hear me out, I'm shooting from the hip here. This is a little on the site revision from yours truly, but what if Hector were more of like an omnipresent technological menace rather than just like a lumbering, big, dumb, hulking thing? I know he like taps in the mainframe of the space station, like closes doors and stuff, but what if he actively like did more? What if he did more to sabotage like the airlock or the, you know, whatever he did to like drive everybody to their knees and control them? All he really does is just grab things with his like big claw. You would feel like in an encounter with Hector, the worst thing that could possibly happen to you would be if he were to fall on you. But the filmmakers were keen on sticking with the massive lumbering robot to drive home the Frankenstein theme. Thus, the most menacing sequence we get is a demonstration of Hector's brute strength when he hauls Harvey Keitel's character onto the laboratory table, dismembers him, and then wears his face. I mean, Hector, uh, he, he puts his face on his, on his head. This is as close as the film gets to equaling its contemporary sci-fi horror films in pure viscera. And though it's initially shocking, it doesn't really make any sense. It almost feels like a reshoot dictated by studio bosses who knew the film wasn't hard-edged enough. So Saturn 3's approximation to the release of Ridley Scott's Alien often gets it unfairly maligned as a ripoff of that movie, which is not true. I mean, they were both put into production at roughly the same time. It's highly unlikely that Saturn 3 would be a ripoff, though in the shade of that movie, its failures become much more apparent. I mean, it's hard not to notice that in basically every way in which one might try to improve Hector's menace, it's accomplished way better by Giger's design of the xenomorph creature in Ridley Scott's film. They could have made the robot more agile and able to hide in the bowels of the moon base and then strike unseen like the alien. Or you could have shot the film in lower and more expressionistic lighting like they did in Alien. However, the moon base in Saturn 3 is always brilliantly lit. Obviously, Barry wouldn't have wanted to obscure the amazing set design with minimalist lighting and shadow, though the film could have benefited from it. But you know what? Brilliant it is. This set looks amazing and it looks expensive. I mean, check out these spectacular dolly shots and that fisheye lens that shows you the entire spectrum of the set. And it makes it look like they're, they're running through the innards of the robot himself, stuck in his world. <laughs> <laughs> You're in my world now! Fuck you. The integration of plant life, space age computers, and mid century modern futurist design makes this set a feast for the eyes. You know, I would implore, I would really, I would really beg any like, you know, nerdy guy who, who's in his basement building 3D renderings of like the Millennium Falcon or the Enterprise or whatever for like the Oculus Rift that you can walk around on. Take a look at Saturn 3. Maybe try constructing a 3D rendering model of the moon base. I mean, boy, would I love to walk around in this gem of like late 70s futurism. Wouldn't that be awesome? And look, when I say nerd, I really, I mean that with the most respect. Obviously, anyone who builds 3D computer renderings of movie sets in the computer uh, is going to have a job in 30 years while I, you know, break my back in the salt mines for President Bezos. So I mean this with all respect. Well, it's no wonder that the sets are spectacular as they were designed by Barry, who is obviously an absolute legend in this field. Which is why it's so unfortunate that this, you know, film probably killed him. So, I mean, after he was booted unceremoniously from the set of Saturn Three, defeated, he returned to George Lucas and offered his expertise to help out with The Empire Strikes Back. And Lucas welcomed him back wholeheartedly. Uh, unfortunately, into the production of the Hoth sequences, he experienced a bout of meningitis and uh, died. And they said that it was probably brought on by stress. But um, to Lucas's credit, he gave everybody on the production of The Empire Strikes Back the day off to go to Barry's funeral. 
at the cost of over a hundred thousand dollars to the production. So it's good that George Lucas recognized what an immense contribution that Barry made to his space universe. I mean, Barry created sets that were so like timeless that they can be mimed 40 years later, virtually without update in the force awakens. And nobody says this looks dated. This looks cheesy. I mean, think about the inspiration he had on the Superman motion picture in 1978 to create Krypton and thus the Fortress of Solitude as a crystalline structure. I mean, this was an idea that was so good that DC Comics actually ditched the idea of the Fortress of Solitude as a castle and just went with Barry's design going forward. The guy left a tremendous legacy. And it's really too bad that when it was his time to shine, it was stolen right out from under him. And on the topic of Stanley Donnan stepping into the director's chair, I don't think his move to usurp the role was in any way treacherous. He backed Barry 100% from the get-go. He just didn't have enough smoke to save his friend's job. And Donnan isn't exactly known as a science fiction or horror director. I mean, he's most famous for directing Singing in the Rain, and most famous for me for directing uh, Charade with Cary Grant and Audrey Hepburn, which is a great movie, which I will do a review of if you'd want. If you'd like that, post in the comments that you want that. I think it deserves a review. So Saturn 3's budget ballooned to over $10 million, which for the time and for a movie with only three characters was pretty outrageous. And obviously at the time at the box office, it landed like a lead balloon. And it occupies a space in the culture now as sort of a like, so bad it's good movie. And you know, but it's totally watchable. It's bad, but I found a lot to like about it. I mean, shoot, I was motivated enough to write about it and to record this video. So I would recommend maybe that if you are interested, check out Saturn 3 as well. There's a lot to like there. No, no, this is... So before we close, guys, I have to pay a debt of gratitude to a film historian named Greg Moss, who has done yeoman's work to preserve the history and legacy of Saturn 3 over at his website, somethingiswrongonsaturn3.com. This is a meticulous archive and timeline of the production of the movie with great, a lot of great stills and tidbits and trivia. And in fact, Greg's work was like so awesome. He actually caught the attention of uh, Shout Factory. And when they put out the re-release Blu-ray edition of Saturn 3, they had him help record the audio commentary. And it's really interesting. I can barely scrape the surface with this video of all the fun bits of information he's got about the movie. So I really wanna thank him because this video review was built on the foundations of his research that he put his blood, sweat, and tears into. He's doing God's work. Go visit his website, check out his blog. And if he ever does happen to see this, I would love to talk to him. So actually, finally, this is really important. I'd like to give a real big shout out to Matt over at Midland Pictures, a YouTube channel that I'll link to in the description, because he was kind enough to include me in a great new YouTube video he did called My Five Favorite Channels Under a Thousand Subscribers. And he was gracious enough to include me in the list, and he had a lot of just like out of bounds, incredibly nice things to say about me. So if you love film reviews and podcasts about film, look no further than the Omaha area's very own George Dahl. His channel, George Dahl's Film Journal, has truly excellent top-notch content and his reviews of off-the-radar films like Pretty Maids All in a Row, The Park is Mine, Van Nuys Boulevard, The Hot Rock, and Ice Station Zebra are terrific. George's personality is magnetic, he's a complete natural in front of the camera, and his knowledge of filmmaking, film history, and these films specifically is vast. One of George's recent video essays on the history of the box office blockbuster is particularly eye-opening as it takes what has always been thought to be common knowledge, that Jaws kicked off the summer blockbuster phenomena, and flips it on its head to reveal that a movie I have literally never heard of is the source of today's biggest blockbuster films. Check out that video to learn more. So if you like my channel because you're into making movies and you wanna to try to do it yourself or you wanna to try to be better, this guy has an immense knowledge about streamlining the editing process for you, especially if you use Final Cut Pro X like I do. He has got some great videos and tutorials on how to effectively make movies, commercials, and to make some money on your, t your hobby, which is something that I actually try to do every once in a while. I, I was just, blown away by Matt's charity in reaching down to a small channel and trying to help him give him a hand up. I mean, this is something that a lot of people just don't do anymore. This is a really kind of cutthroat, you know, area of the internet. I mean, it's not easy to do this. And for him to devote all that time just to say outrageously nice things about me, um, 
I, I don't know how to repay him really, other than to say that you guys should go check out his stuff. I'm a Final Cut Pro user, so his videos, for me, they're really like indispensable resources. And they could be for you too, if you're also into filmmaking. But I, I'm, I have to guess, I'm guessing that my audience is mostly made up of old boomers who are sort of like, uh, it's sort of an interesting curiosity item to find a, a kid that looks like their son uh, talking about old shitty movies that they remember from when they were 14. That's what I have to guess the majority of my uh, fan base is made out of. But go over there and like Matt. And if you haven't subscribed yet, subscribe because uh, the channel's growing, man. Get it on the ground floor while you can. Uh, and something else too, I'm going to post a link to my Letterboxd account. If you guys want to follow me on Letterboxd and see what movies I've been watching, um, go ahead and, and do that. So most importantly, subscribe to the YouTube channel and there'll be more to come. Sorry there's been such a long hiatus between this video and the last one. I've been very busy with work, but everything's starting to really sort of like calm down right now. So thank you guys again for watching. I'll see you next time.